Number two, so it's actually the votes. Hi, everyone. All right, there we go. Cool. Well, it was super cool to see kind of your full presentation about Gitcoin and kind of all the ideology that came into that. And so I'm going to kind of look one layer deeper of like how we can actually uh, store all this data uh, that we need to uh, create these kind of pluralistic profiles of um, individuals that contribute to these systems. And yeah, so um, the network we've been building is really designed to allow us to have a kind of web scale data throughput in a decentralized way. And I'll kind of dive into what that means. Uh, but first, I kind of want to uh, give an overview of um, what this really is. So, this is a slight adaption of, of a talk I gave at DSI, Decentralized Conference, uh, Decentralized Science Conference, that was um, last few days. Um, so, if you missed that, that was really good, uh, good conference. Uh, and so, this is kind of talking from the perspective of like a knowledge graph, but it really generalizes to like a graph of um, contributions and application data generally. Um, so what we set out to achieve, um, like maybe to take a step back, uh, when we started building Ceramic, we were really trying to build a system for identity, uh, but we realized that identity is like not really about you going to some institution, getting some credential, getting like a passport, uh, it's like officially stamped by the government. If you think about your real world identity, it's more about kind of the relationships you have with people and the relationship you have to the world, like your interactions essentially. Uh, and so we wanted to kind of capture that in, in a digital form. Um, so we kind of started thinking about it as a knowledge graph of the internet or generally like a, a contribution graph. It needs to be kind of living and relational, uh, both data and it, and it needs to <laughs> relate to each other, but also like the relationship between people, how they interact online, uh, can also be captured. Um, and one way to think about this is as an emergent web of trust. Some of you might be familiar with like this old PGP web of trust project. Uh, I think the reason that didn't work was that it was trying to like introduce this new social norms about like verifying each other's keys and stuff like that. It was really difficult for people to understand. But if we kind of can have interactions be digitally signed, we can start to kind of have an emergent web of trust. And from that, we can start to uh, extract this kind of like uh, social proximity, which, which the Kevin and, and the Gitcoin guys talked about just now. And once we have this kind of uh, open data graph for Web3, we start to do like collaborative sense making in that. And so I'm going to talk about some of the properties that is really needed to, to achieve this. First of all, we want to be able to share data across applications and across uh, organizations. We don't want the data to be locked into like big stakeholders that just hold the data, port data for themselves, and kind of keep it captured. And we want people to plug into this system and optimize for their specific workflows. Everyone's not going to be want to query data in the same way from the system, um, and we want the data to be composable. Uh, if if a like, Gitcoin creates their kind of uh, profile that adds verifiable credentials. Someone else should be able to plug into that, use that, but also like maybe create some new uh, new way of adding data and still kind of leverage the old data and uh, reference that old data. I think with this we can in increase kind of the rate of innovation in in this kind of ways of looking at uh, plurality. Um, finally, we need authenticity. So we need the system to be censorship resistant. We don't want arbitrary actors to be able to remove stuff. Um, we want every action to be uh, authenticated. This essentially means that uh, users can will, will like sign uh, data, or essentially like accounts will sign data. I think an important piece to realize here is that the system is pseudonymous. It doesn't like require any real kind of uh, <laughs> real world uh, identity, whatever that would mean, um, information. Um, and we also want kind of like secure timestamping. Uh, so we have like verified with all the audit trails of like what happened at what point in time. And with this, uh, authors of data can kind of build reputation. So how can we build this system? 
Well, can we just put it on the blockchain? The blockchain kind of provides all of this, this functionality. Well, the problem with blockchain systems is that some of you might have noticed they don't scale very well. Uh, and so the reason for this is that they, strong, they favor something called strong consistency. Essentially, uh, that means that all transactions need to be ordered in a particular way. And this is really good because, or they, they need to be, all transactions need to be ordered completely. And they can't be like two nodes that have like different ideas of uh, what state of the blockchain is. This is great, it prevents double spends, allows us to do all these nice financial things. Uh, we can do fund management through DAOs, we can fund public goods. We can have cool NFTs uh, that can have a lot of use cases beyond like you know only like um, pictures online. But yeah, the, the, the main limitation here in throughput is that at every block there needs to be an individual block producer that's chosen by whatever consensus mechanism you have that produces the block, which essentially makes the scalability limit whatever one node in the network, the smallest node in the network, can produce or can can compute. So there's essentially two ways um, that different projects are taking to scale blockchains for data. Uh, there's two camps. So big block camp is Solana, Celestia, Arweave. They basically have different mechanisms of um, kind of convincing themselves in the community that like, hey, this is secure. And that's all well and good, but the problem is you still have a big computer that needs to process all of the transactions. And if you think about applications such as Twitter and Facebook and Messenger and these things, they can't scale by having like one centralized server. They actually need to have a huge distributed system. So thinking that we can scale to web scale with, with a blockchain system that just have big blocks, uh, that's pretty far, we're gonna get pretty far off the mark. There is another approach called proof of storage. Essentially that means that you as a user of the system, you can make a, a, an agreement with some node or a set of nodes in the network like, hey, you can store this big chunk of data and there's like proofs that makes kind of guarantees that the data will be there when you want it back. So that's great, now we have a much more throughput in the system, but for every kind of agreement you make, you need to make a, a transaction that needs to go into the block. And most of the time, if you have like millions or hundreds of millions of users, uh, all of those updates are not going to be like big data updates. It's going to be small updates that each individual makes. So we're still kind of like not going to be able to get that through. The, like every all of those small updates, we still need to go through the block. So we need something different. We need uh, a decentralized system that is eventually consistent that allows us to produce data in parallel um, without having the limitation of this. Uh, this block producer that they have in the blockchain. Um, and so I think we can achieve this if we have verifiable audit trails, uh, and ideally that can enable us to have data composability. Um, one big key thing to note here is we can, we can achieve parallel data production without this kind of, um, uh, and, and having eventual consistency uh, by focusing on non-financial data, because the financial data use case really need a strong consistency uh, to be able to function correctly. So let's focus on non-financial data. Uh, I, I kind of tend to think of that as like soul-bound data, because uh, you can't like trade it. So with Ceramic, we're building a solution for this, and we essentially split it into three pieces: uh, event streaming at the bottom, basically like uh, a hash-linked log of events. Uh, on top of that, uh, an indexing system that basically builds a view on top of the event streams. And on top of that is like a GraphQL API that allows you to like easily query the data within the system. So at the bottom, we focus on making event streams available. Uh, so these are independently verifiable event logs. I can sync the state and verify this, the kind of validity of one individual event stream without having to know anything about the rest of the state of the network. And so this is quite different from a blockchain where you need to sync the entire blockchain to know what's going on. Um, and each of these event streams are produced by a, an individual account. Uh, so we use DIDs uh, as a way to represent accounts. And this kind of allows us to have um, individual, or like support any sort of blockchain wallets. So right now supporting uh, MetaMask, but it, we're working on like extending that to like any, um, any blockchain wallet that really can sign a message. 
Uh, and the DID is like a really good way of making an abstraction for that. So each individual account produces their own event strings. So you can choose to index essentially like one account or across multiple accounts. And we use the peer-to-peer -peer network to synchronize event streams. So you can connect to the network, synchronize only the event streams which you care about. And yeah, result of this also is that all data is sold on. Like you as, an, uh, as a user of the system, you would produce your own event streams. And there's no way to trade those event streams. Those are just tied to, to uh, your account, to your Ethereum address, or to whatever other, other address you have. And an interesting thing also is that I can produce an event stream that makes uh, verifiable credentials and claims about other um, individuals. I can claim that you know, you're know you here. And um, Kevin could also have done that and claim that about everyone here as well. And then you can build an index on top of event streams for like the, the presenters of, of tonight and kind of query information about um, kind of social context and that data will also be sold on because you can't really trade that either. Uh, so the event streams rough, roughly looks like this. Uh, every, every event here is, is put into uh, uh, or is hashed and then you can kind of build this hash linked um, uh, stream of events. And so the Genesis event is just like the creation which basically ties the event stream to your account. And then the sign event, so it's like updates to this event stream. Uh, and we also like periodically anchor these event streams into the blockchain. Um, and this is key for like the security of the system because we can now get like secure timestamps. You might wonder like, okay, but now I need to make a transaction for like every time I want to anchor this into the blockchain. But, you know, that seems like a limitation. Well, it's pretty simple to get around that. We can just take a bunch of updates to a bunch of different streams, build a Merkle tree or some sort of vector commitment. You just put the, the root of the tree or like so the vector commitment on chain. Uh, so we can basically group a bunch of updates and put, put them on the blockchain. And so on top of the event streaming layer, we have the indexing layer. And so each node in the network can choose to build uh, an index on top of the event streams. And this index is essentially, um, they can essentially choose which data to index. Uh, so we, we have like an abstraction called data models, which allows you to uh, create a subset of data that describes um, essentially semantically describes some, some data that you might use for your application. And, and each node can choose like which model to index and they don't need to index this data of the entire network. So this is kind of like what really makes it it's scalable because each node can just choose what they prefer to look at. And the interesting thing also with this kind of event streaming and then indexing on top approach is that if someone is not satisfied with the, the kind of database layout or whatever you get from, from the default indexing, they can just plug in directly to the event streams and read the data, maybe perform actions directly based on events or, or build a different sort of index. Um, and I think this, this flexibility is really key. And so finally on top, we're building this more easy to use interface for, for engineers and developers to, to create um, and add data to the system. Uh, so we call this data models. That you can create them using kind of standard GraphQL schema definition language. Uh, you can query the data using GraphQL. Um, and these models, you can discover models that have already been created. And you can kind of compose them. You can take existing model, create a new model that maybe reference the old data or just add some additional data. Um, which, yeah, just like same sort of composability you have in smart contracts, but without the financial pieces. And, and like finally here, like the, the interesting piece of data models is that you as a developer, you define the data model, but then you don't actually define how like a database where, where users write. Any user can create an event stream that writes data to this data model. And as a developer, you can choose to like query all of the data across all of the users or query data across maybe like only the NFT specific NFT holders or something like that. So you can kind of choose, uh, it's like an open open system where anyone can write, but you can choose like which things to include in your view. So just a quick example of what this would look like is that you have here, potentially have a proposal 
and has an author, which is provided automatically by the system and has some text. Then there's a reference to another data model, uh, which is a comment. This is pretty much the same, but it has a proposal ID, which is basically a reference back to the original proposal. So you can see kind of like how you can create two different data models here and how they can reference each other and propose. Uh, and potentially someone could come in. Now, if, if I build this application for, for DAO proposals or whatever, someone else could come in and like, hey, I want to be able to like proposals and upvote and download comments. So we can add like a new data model that uh, allows for that. All right. So, uh, Quickly, some use cases. These are kind of like more tailored to the decentralized science um, um, thing because the slide is from. But I think it's really interesting to think about this sort of way of modeling data as a semantic knowledge graph, where you describe kind of the, the data you put into the system and the relationships between data. Another interesting aspect is you can have more real-time collaboration uh, on things because you have this kind of open write access to write to a data model, and any user can, for example, like create a proposal, any user can create a comment, and it's up to kind of the, the application to choose which data to query. Uh, and it's useful for citizen science, it's useful for building dApps in general, I think. Uh, I think the, the last and I think most interesting piece of this is that once we have this kind of graph of interactions between users, how people contribute to communities, maybe they made a proposal, maybe they made insightful comments, and whatever else you might model into your application, uh, you can kind of look at this graph of contributions to, to your open DAO ecosystem and see which which accounts, which autonomous accounts contributed, and do some sort of like communal retroactive funding for the individuals that contributed. And there you could of course like uh, take into consideration like plurality and things like that uh, as well. All right, thank you all for listening. I hope um, that was uh, helpful. Are you going to take some questions, Joan? If we have time, yeah, sure. Yeah, I think we have at least five minutes. And okay. here's, here, here's a volunteer for a question. Hi there, thanks for the talk. Um, I just wanted to check my own understanding primarily. So event sourcing is about you only ever add but you don't edit to your data sets. Is that right? Yeah, I mean you can think of an event stream as a stream where you put events and you can uh, create, update and delete as actions, right? So you can put different actions into these event streams and yeah, those can be like create, update, delete. So, so, you, so you can deal with removing illegal content or the right to be forgotten, for instance? Yeah, so each, each uh, event stream is... It, each node essentially chooses which event streams they keep available and, and pin to their node. So if there's something that you don't want to be kept available on your particular node, you can remove that. Cool, thank you. Any other question? Everything crystal clear? <laughs> okay. yeah, well, we'll... Here we have one. Yeah. Uh, I was doing some research um, and I didn't want to lose any data, so I thought, okay, maybe store that data on the blockchain. You had some uh, projects in your slides like Filecoin, and I think there's no, uh, this coin, we have like decentralized file space or uh, file system. Uh, is that also a use case you can do uh, around Keramix? Yeah, so uh, Ceramic actually uses for the event stream, the way it's represented, is using the same data model as IPFS uses. It's called IPLD. Um, and it's basically a way to put data into a hash link graph and refer to and kind of create DAGs, the directed acyclic graphs, uh, using uh, in, a, in a kind of standard way of representing this data. You can actually represent the Ethereum blockchain or like Bitcoin blockchain like in inside of IPLD. 
And the nodes um, are there, there's a token, a ceramic token. There's no ceramic token okay. right now, uh, but there's there's going to be because like on in here like right now in the event streaming layer, you need to run your own node and choose which event streams you keep available. Uh, as an end user, that's the hassle, right? So I want to be able to pay the network to keep my data available as long as I want. And so we're adding an incentive layer using using a token um, to achieve that. Um, did you think about like um, a lot of the other projects have like single point of failures, and if there's an emergency like n nuclear war, we maybe have some soon or not? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, did Did you think about if the price from a token drops, maybe your node will turn off or nodes will turn off because? There's no incentive of running a node, so yeah, the files are lost, maybe, because yeah. nodes are turned off. No, it's definitely a valid concern. I think it's true for like any any decentralized crypto system that uses uh, token incentives. Uh, one interesting aspect of Ceramic in particular is that I can even if there's like this tokenized network, and I I, I if I don't, you know, I trust that or I think that like okay, if the token goes to nothing and like I don't believe in the current remediation strategy. I can keep, st still run a node and keep those event streams available on my node. And if the if if the incentive mechanism stops working, the event streams will still be available in the network. Okay. Thank you. I guess you've got. I'm loud too. I I can project. Yep. It's better to take the the mic for the recording. That's good. Um, so, other than Bitcoin, where it sounds like you're kind of keeping their souls, um, are there other, do you have other like real applications that people are starting to use with this or anything else that kind of brings it to life? Yeah, uh, I mean, one, one interesting example that, that uh, recently got built in the community is, is uh, CyberConnect. They're building kind of a, a profile page for projects in the Web3 space. Like, I think as the Web3 space have grown, it's become like much harder and harder to like actually know what's going on and like which projects are relevant, because we have no source of truth. Uh, and I think like if, if they can achieve like one source of truth, that, that would be interesting. So that's just like simple profile page for for projects. But I think they are planning to expand that into more of a social network. Uh, so like the social use cases are interesting. Uh, I think like generally projects around like DAO coordinations uh, is interesting as well. Um, I talked to a bunch of projects that would be interested in using Ceramic at the DSI conference for like um, LabDAO is an interesting uh, example. They essentially want to create a marketplace for people to run lab experiments. So a, a, uh, uh, someone that has an experiment could put up a proposal and people cool. could use like a that. Cool, thanks. Maybe a, a last question, Joel? Sure. Anyone? No? Don't be shy, guys. Ah, she doesn't know. Um, I'm curious how you see like um, um, competitor protocols that are sort of more single purpose, like um, focused around a certain use case um, compared to ceramic, which seems to be sort of a very, very general sort of protocol in the sort of, I guess, social app space. Yeah, interesting. Do you have some example? Um, well, like Lens Protocol is trying to do some like social media stuff. I mean, they're, they're trying to do it on chain, but um, it seems like social media applications could be built on something like Lens Protocol or something like Ceramic. So I'm curious which way you see of the advantages of ceramic over things like Lens. Yeah, so I don't see it as like strict competition. Like I think Lens does interesting things because you can have like incentives through the, the NFT tokenization. And ceramic is not really about like NFTs, it's about like generally building a high throughput data system. I think like if you try to build a system that makes everything, all the data into an NFT, you're gonna run into this problem, right? You can't scale a strongly consistent system to to the scale of the internet. Like 
we can't do that in Rev2, like why would we be able to do that in Rev3? That's, that, to me, that doesn't make sense. But if we can leverage the benefit of like high throughput data that ceramic brings with kind of financialization of certain aspects, uh, like lens brings, I think that's the best of both worlds. All right. Thank you very much again, Joel. So let's now take a little 10 minutes break to, to enjoy some drinks and to breathe a little bit and then we'll come back for the last part of the session.